So welcome to this uh, seminar of the uh, uh, Center for World Christianity here at SOAS. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure to be welcoming uh, uh, Dr. Severin Dununa, uh, who has a number of official functions, um, uh, one of them including uh, being affiliated to Bath University. Um, uh, then perhaps most importantly, um, uh, you're also, uh, she's also a, a director of international development of the Laudato Si Research Institute, which um, is, of course, a um, very well known um, uh, institution. And um, the, those of you who have been in touch with the um, Institute um, in, in, uh, in uh, Oxford, um, then uh, you can ask more questions after the session. Um, I, uh, I myself, I'm also familiar with the um, with Laudato Si, but um, I would um, uh, encourage you to ask questions after the presentation itself. Um, there are a number of um, uh, publications which um, uh, all relate to, which mostly relate to uh, the, the field of uh, economic development, social economic development, and the uh, environment, environmental uh, sustainability um, and spirituality all taken together. And um, I think this is where uh, our speaker today has made uh, a name for herself uh, and for the Institute. So uh, without wanting to say too much, um, I would like to pass uh, the word to um, uh, Dr. Dunona and uh, also invite her to um, maybe say a few words in the beginning and uh, then start with the presentation. So thank you very much and um, uh, all eyes on our speaker. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, so I come mainly from development studies. So I did economics as my first degree and then moved towards ethics uh, with the words of Amartya Sen. And um, so my presentation today is very much situated within the field of development studies but trying to bring insights from um, spirituality or from religious traditions into, into development. So let me share my screen. Um, so what I would like to talk about today is an initiative that the Catholic Church um, started or, or, or um, uh, about two years ago, uh, called the Amazon Synod, based on the document called Laudato Si, which Pope Francis issued in 2015, uh, which is a letter that is written to every person on the planet to have a global conversation on the meaning of progress and how do you understand progress. That for 200 years, we have had a certain vision of progress that has led us to catastrophe. Um, and, and, and so how can we redefine what it means to, to develop in, in a common home? So my, my argument um, would be, well, first I'll start from the religion and development literature, which is what I'm the most familiar with and which has gonna become a kind of field of study in itself over the last 10 years. And within that field of religion and development, there's been so far very little discussion on how reflections on development from within the standpoints of religions can illuminate reflections on development. So there's still kind of, I would say, a secular uh, religious divide. If you know, if we if we see any, um, if we believe in that distinction between between the secular and and the non-secular. Um, but what I'm saying is that there's still very little dialogue on how the reflections on progress conducting from within the you know, theological um, frameworks have informed secular discourses on, on development. And, and then the argument is that while well, development studies is, is a normative field, the very definition of development studies is about um, is this multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary study about how can we improve people's lives? So it, it is really linked to emancipation, um, which is in some ways very much akin to religious traditions. It's also about normative, how we should live our lives and, and how to attain that normative ideal 
and emancipation of liberation, freeing oneself from, from um, all sorts of attachments or addictions or whatever we call them in different religious traditions. And so my question is, was to these reflections on the meaning of development from within religious, religious traditions contribute something to development studies? And I take the example of the Catholic Church and the kind of its conceptualization of development and, and whether it can offer anything for, uh, for development studies. So I'll base this presentation is just five five parts. So first, just an um, introduction about you know the elusive concept of religion. I don't know whether uh, something I need to go quickly through that. Um, as we you know, as we all know, you know the, the definition of religion is a very very contested subject. Then I'll go into development studies and its normative foundations. Then I'll say a few words about the um, the Catholic Church and its kind of understanding of development. And then I'll go into the Amazon Synod and look at implications for development studies or and the the, uh, the research in on religion and development. So, despite I would say twenty years of research now on religion and development, there's still very little uh, I would say on 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 engaging with the thinking on development from within religions. And it begs the question, what do we understand by religions? Um, and here I've decided to take um, a contextual approach, not trying to define what religion, not trying to, to offer something that is universal or general, but look at one specific manifestation of religion, um, which is in the Catholic social tradition. Uh, so the Catholic social tradition is a um, is a body of thought that the Catholic Church has started about 150 years ago, no, 40 years ago, uh, on analyzing the social and economic realities from the perspective of faith. The first document was in 1891, which was called Rerum Novarum, which was a kind of engagement with the Industrial Revolution. So how could the church respond to the, the industrialization, to the, the exploitation of workers in factories, and what would the gospel say to these situations? Um, and so that's kind of started this kind of systematic reflections on socioeconomic realities from the perspective of the kind of the, the Catholic faith. And these documents have been addressed uh, to people of all faith and none since the 1960s. And the latest document is Laudato Si in 2015, which is addressed, as I said before, to, to every person on the planet. Um, and actually in, the, in its early, early days, it was much, much, more, much better received among um, secular circles and the Catholic circles. You had Naomi Klein, for example, who was very much um, promoting the document. While if you went to your average Catholic church in the UK, the parish priest would never have read it. Um, so it was interesting how you know, the, the first um, engaged, the first people who kind of really took it on board were the Naomi Klein and George Monbiot, the kind of, you know, all these, these kind of environmental activists. And the Catholic social tradition is, is kind of an, a reflection of this dynamic interaction between the life of faith communities at the grassroots, academics, and church leadership. So even if it's the Pope that, that kind of signs this, this, these documents, it's not the Pope who, who writes them, <laughs> uh, so to say. They, they kind of emerge from, from, from the life on, on the ground. And if you, you know, if, we, if we go back to the first document in, 18, in 1891, uh, well, it was first the 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 um, the engagement of of faith communities, especially in Germany and and Belgium and, and France, um, with the industrial revolution. So you had um, a few Jesuits in Germany who kind of started to think about. Um, how to respond to these situations of, of exploitation, um, and then you had you know, so, so, you know, workers' movements, and 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 then and then this was kind of reflected upon, and the same with with the environmental 
uh, movement in, in Laudato Si, you have first I think a lot of first of engagement at the local level, especially in Latin America, uh, and and how then that that um, social um, mobilization is then translated at the theoretical level later on. And um, so let's just me say a few words about development studies and its normative uh, foundations. I don't know if many, if some of you are in development studies. I think we should have done some introduction beforehand. <laughs> uh, but um, so at the very notion of development is this idea that you know it's 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 moving from one situation to a better one. And ever since the start of development studies in the 1960s, there has been heavy discussions on 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 what does it mean to to go towards a better situation, what constitutes progress. Know, from the the rest of the the stages of economic growth uh, to human rights to uh, women's women's rights uh, to the MDGs and SDGs today. But there is the consensus today is that in you know, a development and here I take the definition of the Development Studies Association um, is that development is about combating the global challenges of poverty, injustice, and environmental degradation. And from the literature on, 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 on what development studies is, now what is key is that development has a mission. It has a mission to analyze, to transform, and to interrogate processes of social change. So in some ways, development studies occupies a very specific position in the academic field. It's not only about doing research, uh, on something. It's not only about understanding the social reality. It's also about trying to, to, to transform it. So it is to analyze in order to transform that reality. Uh, and, and so this is why you know, development studies borrows from all these different disciplines of sociology, economics, politics, anthropology, law, um, engineering, um, and, uh, and geography. Uh, in order to to transform a certain reality and make it better. So, so I think there is consensus that that development studies is about not only analyzing the problems of poverty and injustice, but also trying to combat them, trying to address them, and 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 be you know, achieving social change through research and involvement with policy and practice. And development studies is, is, is a multiplicity of many disciplines, as, as we know, um, and history comes in. But so far, philosophy and theology are, are not very much engaged with yet. Um, and that became of my argument that we need to engage more with the disciplines of discipline of theology in in development studies, um, because it, it has some insights to 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 say about you know about this mission of improving people's lives, or the mission of combating poverty and environmental degradation. And so far. The, the normative discussions in development studies about you know, what what is what is it to improve people's lives? What does it mean to live a better life? The discussion has come mainly from political and moral philosophy, you know, mainly from Amartya Sen, um, and the Human Development Report. Um, but it hasn't. But it hasn't been kind of mainstream, um, or it has come from feminist political theory, of course, feminist philosophy, um, or Marxism political theory. Um, but if you step aside from Marxism and Amartya Sen and feminist uh, f feminist theory, there is actually very little discussion about the the normative basis of development of what we are what we understand as, uh, as a better state. 
And so and recently, in the last, I would say, five years especially, um, there's been this big movement in development to decolonize. I think it's just becoming better and better. Um, so as, as we all know, development studies is born from the colonial project. The Institute of Development Studies and IDS in Sussex was initially a place to train uh, colonial administrators. The ISS, the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, was a place to train the um, Indonesian uh, colonial, uh, well, post-colonial uh, administrators. So, you know, the, so there wouldn't be development studies today if there hadn't been colonization. And, and now we're kind of really stepping back from it you know, with the roads in this fall, um, the, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, kind of did this movement to think about our own position of power and where is our knowledge coming from? And there's also been a much greater engagement in recent years with indigenous cosmology. So it's not linked to the social movement of indigenous people, um, but also this kind of this movement to 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 decolonize, really, you know, to to see, okay, what can we learn from other ways of knowledge, other ways of knowing the world, and if we take indigenous cosmologies, um, well, unavoidably, we are into the territory of mixing the spiritual and the material, um, because for indigenous people, everything is connected. Um, the, the forest is imbued with spirits. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we need to engage with these cosmovisions of what it is to be human and what it is to relate with, with nature. Um, yeah, I just want to say a few words about the, um, the Human Development Report 2020, which came out in, um, in December last year, and which explicitly um, discusses indigenous cos cosmologies and discusses also Islam and Christianity saying that, you know, that for indigenous cosmovisions, everything is, is interconnected. And we are striving to harmony, to oneness of, of creation. And the, the report is actually trying to deride even these implications of interconnectedness and harmony and this, this strife for, for, for oneness uh, and for, for thinking about development, and especially with thinking what it is to be human. Because even if, you know, if we take the human development approach, you know, what does it mean to, to become more fully human? So then uh, the Catholic Church in its own conceptualization of what it is to be human. The first reflection on development was in the 1960s. So again, kind of into the, 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 the wave of, of, of decolonization. So the 1960s, and also the, the birth of, of the emergence of these new independent countries and how to respond to this new situation of the post-colonial world and this, the first UN development decade. And that's when I think the, the word development was coined into our international vocabulary. And that document in 1967 that was signed by, by Pope Paul VI, talked about integral human development. So that this development that the UN was talking about was not just about economic growth. Um, it had also to be about the development of the person and the whole person. So putting people first. So one could say that more than 20 years before the Human Development Report, you had already a conceptualization of development as, as putting people first. Um, that would then be taken on board by the UN 20 years later. And it talks about the spiritual dimension of life that, that we should not neglect this, this dimension of, of spiritual growth, which it, it, um, it talks about as being open to the values of friendship, of prayer and contemplation. And again, that, that would prefigure the Voices of the Poor document of the World Bank in 2000 that talked about contemplation and prayer as being very important dimensions in, 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 in poor people's lives. So we kind of 
you know, to jump back to that, that development is not just about group material growth, but also about inner growth, about spiritual growth, and 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 increase in the quality of friendships, quality of relationships. And in 2015, it's the second major reflection on development within the Catholic Church with Laudato Si. And this time, a radically different context from the one of 67, which is climate change and biodiversity loss, uh, which in the 1960s was not really much on the agenda. We only had Rachel Carson um, on, on the, I think the, the, um, the Silent Spring was published in 1962. So we were in the very, very early days of the environmental uh, awakening. And Pope Francis develops then that, that thinking on integral human development. And it extends this spiritual dimension um, to relationship with the natural world. And he talks about the manifestation of the divine in anyone who gives herself out of love to help others and to protect nature. So in some ways, you know, the Naomi Klein's of this, of this world, the, the, the Greta Thunberg, um, would be you know, seen as the manifestation of the divine, as any person who gives herself to protect nature is an expression of this, this kind of divine um, presence in, in the world. And it talks about development, not so much in terms of integral human development, but in terms of integral ecology. And it's kind of these two concepts and are now um, used interchangeably. I would not say that the Catholic Church has now um, got rid of the language of development. It's still very much there. There's a deep history for the promotion of integral human development. But you know, given its, its loadedness and its history, there is a move away from talking about development to talking about integral ecology, especially when you think about you know, Latin America and, and the, um, the alternatives to development and the rejection of development because so many, you know, so much destruction has occurred in the name of development in Latin America. The, 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 Amazon, the Amazon forest has been destroyed in the name of development. There is none of this replacement uh, with, with the language of integral ecology, that the striving, you know, the, our goal is not integral human development, our goal is integral ecology understood as harmony, because everything is interconnected. And then what we are looking for is this harmony between these different dimensions of life. And what Laudato Si uh, uh, emphasizes, and, and it's something that we find very strongly in the Human Development Report, that we need to reconsider what it is to be human. And what it is to be human is being part of the wider web of life. So the, what it is to be human is not, it's not about being in control of nature, dominating nature. Being human is being part of something that is our common home, you know, the wider web of life. We, we are part of the animal kingdom. You know, we, we, are, we are sharing the ecosystem with the lions, with the, um, with the hedgehogs, and, and we are all interconnected. And what Laudato C emphasizes, and which, has, which the Human Development Report also emphasizes, is this idea of inner growth, that development is not something that is to be done out there in the Global South. Development is something that we also do in the Global North, but also within ourselves, this idea of personal transformation. And that connects with the decolonization uh, movement, and uh, looking at our own place in our relations of power. Uh, how do I deal with power in my own relations? Am I aware of my white bias? Am I aware of my Eurocentrism? Uh, am I aware of my own patriarchal bias? And, and so and what do I need to do to transform myself? 
And that's something that, that we see more and more in, in development studies, this relationship between development as a global structural project, but also as something that is much more personal um, and, and, and how the two are connected, how the personal change is connected to structural change. So change has to be integral. And the message from Laudato Si and, 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 and from the decolonization movement is that it's, it's above all us humans who have to change. And, and, and the decolonial movement would say, you know, it's, it's Western academia that has to change. It's us academics that have to change the way we do our research, the way we collaborate with global researchers, with researchers in the global south. And so we need a profound transformation of everything um, in our lifestyles, in our models of production, in established structures of power, uh, and also in ourselves. And in order to start implementing that structural transformation, well, the, the place to start um, is the Catholic Church itself. Uh, so you know, the Catholic Church as well needs to be transformed. Um, according to its own vision. And this is why the Pope convened the Amazon Synod in 2019 to start this process of transformation of the church, but also of structures of, pro of production and, and consumption. So the, the Amazon Synod was, was the first assembly of the Catholic Church to discuss a situation in a territory. It wasn't dealing with a topic as previous assemblies before, it was discussing a territory. And you know, we see um, a parallels with development studies that we are no longer looking at countries, we are looking at biomes, and the, because ecosystems are beyond nation states. No, it, uh, we need to look at, at things in an integral way. Uh, and, and so instead of looking at a topic, let's say migration, or let's look at what's happening in a specific um, ecosystem, biome or territory. And it's the first synod, the first assembly that didn't include only ordained um, men, um, but also indigenous people. And more than 100 delegates from indigenous organizations came to Rome, and here's your know, pictures, um, to participate in the discussion so that they, they would be driving the agenda. And before the, the meeting, um, there, were, there has been a massive consultation exercise with 87,000 people over two years about how they saw development. Um, and the role of the church in, in the Amazon region. And um, so just here, the process, so you had a working document um, to discuss, that was then discussed in, in the assembly, and then the final document, uh, and then the Pope's own reflections on, 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 the, on, um, on the meeting. And I just want to highlight in three areas that from, from that meeting, from the Amazon Synod that we could take for development studies. One is the area of interconnectedness of all life systems um, and the search for harmony as a normative criteria with which to assess progress. And I think we see that already in the Human Development Report 2020 by borrowing from indigenous cosmovisions, the report is moving um, the human development discourse towards this harmony um, with, uh, you know, between all spheres. And here I quote from the Instrumentum Laboris, uh, which is the working document you know, um, from the indigenous people. The root life should not be seen in terms of accumulation of material roots, but as harmony with oneself with nature, with other human beings, and with the supreme being, as there is intercommunication between the whole cosmos, 
where there are not excluders and excluded so that we can all form a project of life in plenitude. And here, you know, another passage, we are part of nature because we are water, air, earth, and life of the environment created by God. And this quote actually is, is also um, um, not replicated, but we find a similar quote from a First Nations uh, community uh, from the United States in, in the Human Development Report, that we are water, we are air, um, that we, we cannot be separated, that, you know, that of, as humans we, we share, we, we share with, with wider ecosystems. And then the second area that I would argue development studies could borrow is this idea of, of structures of sin, or we could call them structures which undermine all lives in common, and the recognition of our participation in these structures. And I think here we, we find parallels with the decolonization movement and structures of power and our own participation in patriarchy, in colonial relations of power. Uh, and, and here the, um, the Amazon Synod discussed the commodification of forest and water and the domination of financial interests. Uh, here I quote from the, the final document, you know, they, uh, they identified the structures of you know, the privatization of natural goods, of water, illegal um, loading concessions and illegal loading, um, made their projects, um, and they said, no, behind all, these this are dominant economic and political interest with the complexity of some government officials and some indigenous authorities. And so here, the, the document is, is inviting all of us to think about our own participation in these structures, especially through our investment. And with the Catholic Church, we are, uh, what well, they are thinking about, you know, where the money is invested, um, how to disinvest from fossil fuels. I was just reading The Guardian this morning, uh, a report about the University of Oxford that had received 11 million pounds of donations uh, from fossil fuel industries over the last 10 years. Um, so, so kind of looking at you know, what is the university's own position with regard to the structures of power and structures of which undermine all lives in common. And then and the Pope Francis talks a lot about the throwaway culture as, a, as another structure that is undermining our life in common. Um, this you know, that 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 makes us you know want more and more resources. Um, and then the third uh, area that I would argue development studies could borrow from is this idea of self reflexivity at the collective and individual level. And starting with the church itself uh, and, and looking at the church's own collaboration in the globalization enterprise, its exclusion of women, its corruption, and you, the church is only starting that process um, of recognizing its own collaboration in this destroying indigenous culture. Uh, in excluding women, uh, in in uh, sympathizing with dictatorships and, and so on. And it's a very slow process. Um, but this, this, this idea is actually very um, central to Pope Francis papacy. It is the idea of bringing the peripheries to the center. Not that the peripheries can become the center, but that the peripheries can transform the center. And this is the, the, the dynamic of the Synod, is to bring the wisdom from indigenous communities, from those who've been suffering at the margins, and bring the knowledge into the center. So it's, it can be seen as the same dynamic as this decolonization movement, um, to get away from this Eurocentrism and take from the wisdom the ways of knowledge of people who are suffering at the margins and the peripheries and bring that to the center so that they can transform the center. And this 
kind of approach is, is now being replicated beyond the Amazon. Um, we actually here at the Laudato Si Research Institute, we started an initiative of networking churches in the Tongro Basin, in the Philippines, in India, in Oceania, uh, and in North America with, uh, with Canada, the First Nations, um, and in Europe. Um, bringing these different networks together to think about this interretological conversion uh, and bring the, the, the wisdom of you know, the people of Papua New Guinea, the wisdom of the people of, of the Amazon into, in, in, into Europe, into, into North America and how the churches in, in Europe could be transformed um, and, and recognize their own uh, participation in the stretches of, of power and the stretches of, of destruction, um, of environmental destruction. Uh, but this is not to say that this is uh, this process of uh, integral cultural conversion is not resisted. Um, Pope Francis has a lot of opposition in Rome and especially in the United States. Um, and power and politics is at the heart of the Catholic Church, like any other organization. Uh, and and it, is, um, it is a difficult process. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the process has been set in movement uh, and, and it'd be interesting to see how in the next 10 years, this process um, develops. Um, so just to wrap up about the implications for development studies, um, well, there is a, there was, a very good book on um, development studies and its future that's been published in 2019. Um, that was the outcome of some uh, meetings of the European Association of um, Development um, Institutes. And you now what it um, argued is that you now development studies needs a new vision. And in that new vision, it must that new vision um, must reflect not only the interdisciplinarity. Um, and now we are, we've seen development studies um, bridging more and more with the sciences, you know, with engineers, with, uh, with physics, with uh, geology, with hydrology. Um, but we also as a need to, to reflect, that the development studies needs to reflect these multiple forms of knowledge. And we started that process with um, respecting the forms of knowledge from indigenous cosmovisions. And I wonder whether the next step now will be to respect the forms of knowledge from within religious traditions. Whether that could be a kind of a new area for development studies. And there is no reason why you know this process or, or this this work that I've started to do within the Catholic Church um, can be done at with other other div, other. Um, other religious traditions. Actually, I'm starting a project with, with Islam of translating Laudato Si in the Quran. So someone will be working at taking the Quran and looking at you know, all the, 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 um, the, the Quranic um, on the pinnings of the argument of Laudato Si. Uh, and, um, and so yeah, it is for thinking of what it is to be human and going beyond the human nature, material, spiritual dichotomies. And I think we are, we are still very much in that dichotomy, um, even uh, in the religion and development research, you know, the sacred and the secular, we still talk in terms of these dichotomies, you know, but how to go beyond them, how to go beyond the material, spiritual, the sacred, the secular, and the human and the nature. And I think that will be the challenge um, for development to, to go beyond these dichotomies. Um, and then explore you know, how then these religious, religious traditions that go beyond these dichotomies um, can better fulfill the commitment of development studies. And I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Lars. Now stop share. You. Oh, you can, yes, let, let's do it like this. Um, <clears throat> 
you just forgot one um, quite important detail, namely the book that you're uh, going to be publishing in June. <laughs> I, I shared the um, publication details in the uh, in the chat function, if you can see it, but um, mm. uh, maybe you can j just say two or three words about uh, the, the main focus of, of, of your book. So the so, so the book is it's not going forward in in that dialogue between one tradition of thought um, with the human development framework with Amartya Sen, and then the other tradition within the Catholic social tradition, and and how they can inform each other uh, on three areas: one on the meaning of development, the second areas on the anthropology or what it is to be human. And then the third is about social transformation. And so in these three areas, I look at how the religious tradition um, can inform human development, but also how human development and the human development reports um, and the you know, MRTS and the capability approach can inform the, the religious tradition, especially on, on, on women um, and on, um, on power. And politics. That's the nutshell of the book. Thank you very much. I, I mean, I had um, a lot of questions. Actually, the if if I can just uh, jump the queue and uh, and just ask you about the last point that you made the the yeah, well in your in your summary already. Um, I, I was um, going to ask you about the uh, implications for areas where other religions are more important and then of course islam is tremendously important in southeast asia for example um is um it, it, from the laudato si point of view um, is there a um, um a certain confluence that is possible that you see uh, you said that you're, you're looking at the quran at the moment in order to see whether there are parallels but um in from a development point of view do you think that um, Christianity in the tradition that you, in the newly shaped tradition that you uh, uh, outlined earlier on, and Islam uh, have the same perspective on, um, you know, creation, role of God, the role of uh, the human in this environment? Well, I think this is to be explored um, on on the surface they have the same perspective uh, from the discussions I have had on the subject already. Um, actually, a couple of months after the data C came out, there was an Islamic declaration on climate change that follows exactly the same structures of the data C and is much shorter. And, and that was, um, this, it was called the Istanbul Literary Declaration on Climate Change. And it was uh, pushed by Islamic Relief and, and a few few other Islamic organizations. Um, but actually it hasn't been much widespread. Uh, talking to some Muslim scholars, they've never, they had never heard of it. Uh, in terms of the teachings, I wouldn't say there is much difference. Um, and uh, the, the Pope has, uh, has made this kind of agreement with uh, um, the, the Grand Mufti of, uh, of Al-Azhar the declaration of of fraternity and cooperation, um, and this is actually something that I'm going to look at much more um, in in the future. I'm just starting a, a project also with Masuda Banu on uh, on care for the earth and care for the poor, um, looking at at the the Muslim and the Catholic traditions um, in in comparative perspective. But what is I think the the major difference is the organizational difference and the trajectory of the countries. Um, is that within Christianity or within, within the Catholic Church, we have a structure of, of knowledge in some ways. You know, we, uh, and the Catholic Church is very centralized. Um, and we have the, the authority of the Pope, um, the digital magisterium. And there, there is reflection on development that's been going on for a long time within the World Council of Churches. Um, and I'm not dealing with them, but I know they, they exist. And, and uh, um, But the World Council of Church document doesn't have the same um, 
the same um, status as, as, a, as a document from the Pope uh, within, within the Catholic Church. Um, and within Islam, we have the same issue is that you don't have the central authoritative teaching figure. Yes, you have the Imam, um, but the, no, the Imam of, of Indonesia, for example, of, uh, no, of, of, of a mosque in, in, um, in, in Jakarta, doesn't have authority over a mosque in London. Um, uh, and it's, yeah, it, it's something that, that needs to be addressed. And I think there is a movement in, in renewing Islamic scholarship on, on these, these debates and, and have some much more harmony and, and, and collaborations. Um, uh, but I think organizationally it's, it's difficult for the, for the, the, the Muslim tradition, for the Islamic tradition to have, to have such a common document, um, not unless we, we do a lot of networking, which, we, which you know, we hope to do with this, this project on, on the Quran, try to get you know, in, Indonesian leaders, get, um, get, you know, get, get people from the, the Islamic centers of learning on board. Um, Thank you very much. That's um, th there's much more to be said. That, that's also thinking of Africa. But uh, but mm, yeah, I, I wonder who who amongst you uh, would like to ask questions first. Nicholas, I see a hand going up there. Please go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Den Denowin. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I wonder if I can start by um, commenting on international law. Um, you are probably familiar with the Convention on Biological Diversity from 1993, and also for the Council of Europe's Bern Convention on the Conservation of European Wildlife and Natural Habitats, uh, for, which was the earlier one in 1979. These international uh, documents have preambles, and in the preamble of both of these, there are reasons given for the conservation of biodiversity. And apart from the usual ones given of uh, when it's useful to people, there's a very interesting phrase. Both of them use the phrase attributed to biodiversity of it possessing intrinsic value. In other words, a value that has absolutely nothing to do with its usefulness to human beings. And that it seems to me bridges the three main monotheistic religions really rather nicely. Mm -hmm. And I would tie it in with what I would respectfully suggest as the correct interpretation of Genesis chapter one. When humanity is given its role, its raison d'etre, its job, and that is not to exploit, because that's not what I understand the Hebrew to say. It says govern. And government of the natural world is thus given to human beings as their primary fundamental raison d'etre. And government is carried out not for the benefit of the govern, of, of those governing, but for the benefit of those who are governed. In other words, we realize our true identity, our true reality by caring for that which we have been given, responsibility for which we've been given. And that, it seems, transforms the entire approach that we should have. Sustainable development is not the key. It's caring for and looking and preserving and looking after and conserving the whole of the integrated, interconnected reality that is biodiversity. And that, it seems, ties in with what I understand to be the orthodox tradition's view of the the liturgy, which incorporates the concept of representing back to God through the uh, sacrifice in inverted commas of the whole creation. We are restoring through the liturgy, the creation back to God. We are fulfilling our human duty to return it to that status that God originally created. 
And I wonder whether, to, to what extent you have had um, contact with the Ecumenical Patriarchs the Religion, Science and the Environment Symposia that he's been organizing since the 1990s, um, one of which was on the Amazon in, I think, 2006. These, of course, dealt with um, inviting not just scientists, not just politicians, but also theologians from the, and I put them in this uh, chronological order, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic backgrounds. So that there's been a substantial exchange of views on ecological matters, um, which has been overseen by the Ecumenical Patriarch going back um, for nearly 25 years. I wonder to what extent you found those um, um, that as a, a helpful um, source of um, well, helpful source of help. I suppose um, it's very good that the um, um, papacy has effectively come come on board, and I and I'm delighted with its efforts on the environmental front. Um, but I don't think it was quite the first. No, not at all. Thank no, you very no. much. No, no, and actually in Pope Francis in the letter C starts the document by acknowledging um, the ecumenical patriot, uh, um, um, patriarch. Uh, now I am, I am fam very familiar with the, the Orthodox, um, the work on the Orthodox, in the Orthodox Church on, on these issues. Now I've, I've read the book by, uh, is it Christo, Christo Vadis on um, uh, the John Christo Vadis? On liturgy and um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, I, I am aware of this dialogue and and, and my colleague um, Celia Dindremont, I know has attended uh, one or two uh, of these meetings. Um, and there's definitely much more work to be done in terms of of um, of learning from each other. Um, yeah. I don't know the extent to which the Amazon Synod was was um, looking at the the Orthodox Church. I think it was looking much more from you know, the indigenous perspective. Um, but there's definitely probably more work to be done on on this exchange. Uh, and I know that in the Protestant uh, world they had this uh, Vupertal uh, conference and Vupertal declaration uh, a year or two ago. Um, so there's all sort of attempts to have to have some some common documents or common statements. Um, yeah, yeah. And talking about the, the biodiversity, um, the uh, the Das Gupta report that came up came out in February this year on the economics of biodiversity has a chapter on the sacredness of uh, of nature, um, going back to the intrinsic value of nature. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, Nicolas. It's a um, very uh, worthwhile comment because, uh, of course, mo more important than any law or any political considerations are those that go to the, the, the very heart of uh, the, the discourse, which is the, um, you know, the, the position of uh, creation and what, what, is, um, what we do with it as, uh, as believing being, beings. Jörg, uh, your hand went up. Yeah, I just wanted to pick it up there. Hello, Severin, good to see you. Um, you, you said, um, and I, I was quite intrigued by this, you said that development studies might have a lot to learn from religious language and taking on religious concepts such as sin. And to one extent, to some extent, I, I agree with you, but I'm also struggling with that notion because um, what is it to gain for people who are not religious um, or who are from a different religious background to learn that language? Um, so I, I can see the usefulness of, of developing a number of synergies between, let's say, an ideological critique of the assumption that everything needs to grow, that the economy needs to grow, or we're going downhill, and, uh, you know, biblical notions about greed. So, you know, Beyond, however, just bringing people together and discovering those synergies and then saying, how can we join up those movements in a common fight against climate change? I don't know what there is to gain of development studies itself as sort of a discipline that doesn't, that isn't rooted in a particular religious tradition, what they would have to gain from the religious tradition. So religious literacy, I see, 
synergies I see, but it, it sort of incorporating a particular religious language within a discipline that's not theological. I don't know what is what you what you were thinking of there. So, so I wanted to push you on that a little bit. If if I may ask a second question, is that allowed? All right, thanks a lot. Um, the, the other question I have, you know, that Emma and I had this small pilot project on the sustainable development goals, and we just, you know, then found on, on the grassroots, there's so little engagement. And that's, of course, a frustration that many of us share, um, perhaps more if you're more of an observer like myself, that there is all these top level organizations and declarations and gatherings that when you then look at the ground level, they don't really seem to connect all that well. So how does how does this filter down? How can this really translate into grassroots movements, especially in the issues of climate change, which in the areas that are most affected by climate change often translates into basic needs? So you work with organizations around hunger, drought, those kinds of things. And of course, not climate change advocacy, because the most urgent thing is to get people water and, 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 and fed. So so there's also that kind of disconnect. So do you see that that fight then is something that stays more outside in the West or is this something that we can bring into more of a grassroots approach, let's say into communities in Africa and other places? Mm. Thank you, no, good questions. Um, I would say that I would be more in the religious, the synergies more than adopting the language. So what, uh, it's not about, no development studies borrowing suddenly the language of structures of sin um right. but it's about taking the idea that there are structures which are undermining life in common or we talked about structures of you know, vices like no greed or you know um, uh, mm -hmm. and um or, or like this idea of conversion um but it's not an idea that travels outside religious circles Right. But it doesn't mean that transformation cannot travel or inner growth in the transformation. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a good point that not, that that what we should emphasize is how the ideas that are born from within religious traditions can travel outside. Um, so this idea of synergy or translation, but not necessarily, not necessarily these religious concepts of sin or, or conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, but but yeah uh still the same the same ideas uh um like you no know, even love for example was it the you know the the uh, thought of concept of kenosis <laughs> um you know of self-emptying uh for the sake of the other well this is something that that would travel outside the religious language of of you know with the environmental defenders for example on the ones who are risking their lives giving their lives for the sake of protecting the forests um uh, so I think this is where I was coming from with this idea of synergy uh, more than, than adopting the language. Um, Thanks. And on the, on the grassroots, uh, I think it probably depends on the context, uh, because in Latin America, the grassroots is so affected by destructive development with the mining explorations and um, <laughs> That, um, that these documents do, do filtrate at the local level because they kind of have a resource of mobilization um, against the extractive, against governments or... Uh, and, um, well, I don't know, in Africa, it may be, it may be a different, different context. Um, and, it probably also depends on on the structure of the of the organization in some in uh, um, the role of missionaries, the role of of the hierarchy in the Catholic Church, and how you know the bishop, the bishop then influences the priest um, uh, or or mission or, or the missionary orders. Um, you know, for example, if you know, the Jesuits decide that the orientation is care for common home then every Jesuit in the world, whether in the most remote you know, place of, of, of Kenya, um, will have that as, is, as, as, the, as the focus. Um, yeah. Uh, it would be interesting to look at the context and, and you know, from my 
limited knowledge of, of Africa and, and for my interaction with the the Congo and the um, the uh, the red back the and the red the um, ecclesial network for the Congo basin, it's very much a reality for them deforestation and um, so it maybe then Ethiopia is another context I don't know. Well, no, I mean, it depends very much on the context of where you are, but in, in terms of the stakeholders that we interviewed, the climate change oriented goals, you know, clean water, air, ranked relatively low on the sort of, and those were countrywide organizations. So yes, locally, when there's land grabbing going on, when there's drought, these things may pop up, but it's hard to translate that into sustained grassroots effort and efforts in, in many areas. And of course, it doesn't make a difference whether there's a Catholic priest who has this in their hand already. If it doesn't resonate with what local farmers are experiencing or seeking, then it, it doesn't make a difference either. So, yeah. But thank you, that, that's that's very helpful. On, on the thing about synergies, Emma and I wrote an article where we kind of spell this out with uh, Laclau's philosophy of sort of broadening political groups. Um, and, and kind of um, generating sort of a, a grassroots um, movement that understands politics as forging synergies under labels that everybody can agree to. Um, that was in social policy and uh, society came out last month. So I can send you the reference if you're interested. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, send me the reference and I'll uh, look it up here. You see, this is what these um, uh, seminars are for. They are places where we can exchange ideas and where we can uh, suggest, um, you know, new research to each other. And then old research, old, uh, what Nicholas uh, earlier said, yes, it, this does go back to the 1970s, definitely. This is a very um, a discussion which um, has um, cross-fertilized um, different academic uh, disciplines, but then also uh, the faith communities, uh, the discourse in uh, in general, you know, if you picked up a newspaper in the 1970s, the topics would be completely different. Um, uh, Thunberg, no, nobody would have mentioned her, as, as, as that um, she, she would have been a little girl somewhere. Now, of course, uh, this is something that uh, has uh, changed us the way that we think, and um, uh, it is only logical that uh, you know this uh, ha has a direct impact on the uh, uh, religious structures that we belong to. Uh, now, Francis, uh, your hand has been up for some time. Yes, please go ahead. It has, and I'm probably behind the times now. I was I was going to pick up on that interplay between um, religion and the language of religion and the language of human development, and get they can teach each other. Um, my own work, which was in the um, Andes of Ecuador, um, was precisely trying to look at that and looking at integral development as understood by the Catholic social teaching, and I do say teaching rather than tradition here, um, and how that not only that was implemented, but how the impact on it, on the integral development of marginalized children, they happen to be indigenous children, how that could be measured um, in terms of all the aspects, obviously, of their development. Sorry, I'm losing my sentence here. Um, I was looking at Jesuit education in a rural area, and what I did was to adapt a sense capability approach to measure the impact of the Jesuit schools that work with those children. And um, there have been studies um, carried out on the impact of various institutions on children. But to me, I wanted to adapt that to take into account spirituality, to take into account solidarity, collective values, which, as we know, are or are supposed to be very important in Andean cultures. Um, and I found the two worked very well. And you can use the capability approach to measure such things, not spirituality, but the children's perception of how the school helps them develop their spirituality, the parents perception, which is not always the same, of how the school impacts on that. Um, and so there, there is an interplay there between um, something like the capability approach. Precisely, I think, because it is not a complete theory of justice, we can take it 
and adapt it mm. to, to do what we want. And I would love at some stage to have a, um, a longer conversation with Dr. Denelin on this one. Mm. Hey, do you, have you written it somewhere? Is it a paper was, that you... That was my PhD thesis, which um, was completed last year. Oh, so it's very recent. Okay. So I spent two years in the Ecuadorian in Andes. Um, and when I read about perfect harmony of <laughs> communities and people and nature, yeah. uh, human nature is the same everywhere. <laughs> But um, the, the work of um, the Jesuits, actually, it is mainly the Jesuits, but their work on, on um, integral um, development is very interesting, but it's, um, it's not easy and it's not always successful. But I, I do feel that by using something like the capability approach, suitably adapted, mm. then one can get helpful pointers as to further develop um, the education that is provided for mm. integral development. That's it. So where can I find your PhD? Is it on, on some database? <laughs> I can, or I can send it to you. I put I embargoed it for a year, so it's not yet it's University of London, but I can I would be happy to send it to you. Oh. There are three pages called as Donella in the bibliography. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do work with Elaine or something? Or? I worked, uh, I started at Heathrow College and then they closed ah. it and I, I went on with the School of Advanced Study. What, the School of what? Advanced Studies. Advanced Studies, at, okay. It's college at the University of London. It's the University of London Senate House behind me. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Anyway, Francis, fascinating, very, very interesting. Uh, do we have more questions? <clears throat> um, any of the other speakers? I know that people are dropping off because they have to go back to their jobs. And uh, um, but, uh, yes. Last round, no. Yes. So, uh, am I allowed one last question? Just a short one. It's um, um, when you that, that takes us back to the very beginning, um, where where the um, uh, the topic of development studies is introduced. And um, I, I, um, I mean, it shows my age. I mean, I actually remember how the the term was discussed in the very beginning. You know why. Why is it not decolonization de de uh, studies rather than anything else? Um, but but um, it's um, this image where, uh, taken in 1961, I think, where this man is holding up the, uh, um, the, the sign celebrating the end of the colonial era. And I, I just wonder whether we are underestimating the, um, the, the, the impression that we have in um, uh, well, we refer to it as the global south, uh, that uh, environmental protection is a first world concern. And um, I'm saying this because my, um, uh, my interest is in China, and uh, I followed the, uh, the changing um, discourse that you've had in China from the, uh, well, when I first uh, could read Chinese was in 1980. So if you, if you picked up not just party uh, papers, but any any kind of Chinese um, uh, medium, the, the emphasis was clearly on economic development. So how can we get our factories to, to belch out even more uh, fumes in order to make us all richer? Um, th this is something which is, has changed in, in China and in uh, some other countries which have uh, managed to develop. But I, I wonder whether we're uh, collectively guilty of the sin of uh, um, underestimating the, um, the, the, um, the, the reservations that uh, poor people have in uh, the world who uh, think that we're somehow depriving them of economic uh, progress. Um, I know that I, I know of all the discussions. I know what, what, what of course, the, uh, the the context is. But in our publications, we we this tends to be a, a blind spot, and um, um, I'm I'm myself guilty of this. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm quite clear. I just wonder whether you have any thoughts about this, Severi. So whether uh, 
uh, a first world problem. <laughs> uh, well, certainly we bear more responsibility in it. <laughs> Our ancestors bear more responsibility in it. Uh, um, but yeah, we need to. Kind of, I don't know what. No, if they, there is a response to that. Uh, um, in in the reception of. If you think of the fact that the majority of the Christians in the world are now at home in the, uh, you know, in the global south, um, and, you know, you have a Pope who now says, from Rome, from his, uh, you know, air-conditioned uh, suite, um, you know, uh, we should be um, kind to nature, um, th then they, they, they look at their plot and they think, well, we should exploit the earth. Um, so how, how do you, do you think this is a potential problem? Well, not if we take the perspective of those who are exploited and marginalized. Now, if, if, you, let's say if you look at Indonesia and if you take the perspective of the poor, the ones who are suffering from the, the palm oil plantation, the old pine plantations, um, their response will be very different from the business elite. Uh, and, and so it's about trying to, to see the situation from the perspective of those, those who are marginalized and those who suffer. And from their perspective, addressing climate change and environmental concern is, is a problem of everybody. <laughs> um, and not just the global north, uh, not but the Indonesian elites, the uh, Congolese politicians, um, and 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 yet the European investors who invest in 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 these companies or not do. Um, uh, so yeah, I would say that that would be the the, the perspective of you know. It's not taking the environment as such, but taking the perspective of those who live at the margin. And so if we see the world from their perspective, and it's an idea of solidarity, uh, uh, then, yeah, then it's the responsibility of, of every single person. Thank you. Yeah. That, that's uh, uh, a very comprehensive answer. Um, any questions? So, um, so uh, thank you profusely, and um, uh, it was a great pleasure to have you here back again uh, since before COVID. In any case, <laughs> you were here, so we, I hope that we can uh, uh, all meet again uh, at SOAS in person. Um, or in other places even, but um, uh, if it's uh, always um, wonderful to see ac academic work in progress, and this is of course uh, both spiritual and academic work, but uh, it will be published so by an academic um, university press, Routledge, so um, the, your book, so I I'm looking forward to reading that too. Thank you. And I'll be in touch with your then Francis to send me your your yeah. work. We're yes. interested to read it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you also. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.